Joining me today is a very special guest in Parker Kennedy. Parker is a UW decathlete, and uh, we vibe on a lot of different levels in terms of just the way that he utilizes mindfulness and meditation to not only improve his relationships and his day-to-day life, but how he implements them into athletics. Parker also discusses a near-death experience that occurred to him when he was uh, preparing for a track and field event, and I think this really propelled him into higher states of consciousness, and he took it in stride and as a way to grow. But all in all, just an awesome conversation and a lot of transparency showed from him and hopefully myself. A a deep connection that I feel with Parker will continue to grow as the podcast continues to grow. So I hope you guys enjoy. Hope you guys take something from it and uh, keep flowing. All right. Hello and welcome to The Flow Station. I'm your host, Will Ferris. And as always, the goal is to help you cultivate your unique flow by bringing on guests who have tapped into theirs. Speaking of someone who's tapped into theirs, I got Parker Kennedy in the building today. Appreciate you coming in, man. Thank you so much for having me, Will. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So Parker has been, he's been a loyal follower of the Flow Station. I get a couple comments here and there from him, and I noticed he was, uh, his bio even, you know, he's got flow in the bio. I was like, it's it's only right to, to bring him on, and he's a UW decathlete, and so he'll have some unique experiences, I'm sure. Appreciate you coming in, and uh, hopefully we can get into the deep flow. Yeah. Excited to see what comes up, man. <laughs> yeah. So just real quick, um, obviously you've been studying flow a little bit and mindfulness and meditation. Um, what would you, how would you define flow for you in terms of not just in the athletic sense, but mm-hmm. for you on a day-to-day basis? It seems like now after studying some flow versus like experiencing in my childhood, there's definitely in flow, like things harmonize with yeah. thoughts, feelings, actions. Um, everything is kind of in harmony which then takes you into this like deep presence and a lot of times like self transcendence. So like an overall harmony in our experience, which results and, in and flow. When do you, and, and you were talking a little bit about like when you were a little kid, you had a, like a, a great upbringing. And so it allowed you for some flow experiences. How did that awareness allow you to, when you started to read about it, be like, did it, did a light bulb kind of go off in your brain? Like, Oh wow. Like I've experienced this before. Uh, I definitely, when I read about flow could see, like how much flow I'd experienced growing up. But my journey like into being more and more interested into flow kind of came from these other dimensions of like science, the near death experience, then like going into the inner journey and then being like, oh, flow in athletics is this is it. Mm. Like this is what I'm trying to find, you know, how do we wow. get in flow and what is flow? So what was your flow as like a little kid? Like what was what was that experience like? <laughs> Nature, just Mm. adventuring with whether it be my sister or my friends like we just had big forest in our backyard streams ponds like orchard we raised on a farm and also like I got a motorcycle when I was young so just like going out in the orchard just (laughs) ripping around and just like (laughs) being in it you know just growing up the whole time yeah I think as I've uh come back uh you know I was in SoCal for three years and so there's not a lot of nature and even if you're in nature it's pretty dry Mm -hmm. but as I've come back and I'm I live in Redmond now and so there's just a bunch of parks and trails and like live by the lake and and there's so much nature I've realized how much of a deep flow that is like when you really just release into it yeah um do you still find that as a place where let's say you're getting a little stressed like you just go into nature and, and that tunes you back in Yeah, for sure. I was today just coming outside um, as I was leaving to come here, like came out in the sun, like there's some, I'm in an area that has some trees and stuff, you know, it's just like totally different feel than being in my studio, you know. For sure. And now like science and the medical world is saying nature is this amazing drug that (laughs) we can engage with, you know, Yeah. that helps the mind. And you kind of brought it up briefly, but you had, so it was near death experience. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, I didn't know it was that deep, yeah. but so go tap into that story <laughs> and like, yeah. how did that assist your flow now? Yeah, that um, this event accident happened after my senior year of high school in a decathlon. Um, Javelin's the ninth event in the decathlon out of 10. And I had been doing super well leading up to that and was really excited to throw Jav because I was feeling good. <laughs> and then at the end of our warmups, we were walking back with the guys doing some little throws in the field. And I guess I kind of just like relaxed, you know, got out of focus because I was just so hyped that I kind of got oh, just like out of the zone a little bit. Yeah. And just casually did another throw, two hands over my head. It's like a warm up throw that a lot of jab throwers learn and just held on to the jab and released 
like down in front of myself and javelin's like eight foot long metal spear so the back end was like two feet away from my head and as i followed through i fell basically onto the back end and it ricocheted off my nose and pierced just above my eye and went about three or four inches into my brain um and so (laughs) like took a second to realize what happened and then once i like fell to the ground because i went onto it and then pulled back yeah so then i fell to the ground and realized what happened and it felt like my eye had just been like obliterated thought my eye was just you know gone done but then it felt like the javelin had gone down into my like throat because the part of the brain that it hit was associated with nerves like in my face um so it felt like the javelin had done some serious damage which i mean it had but it felt really really bad um and then once people surrounded me and then someone, I think the medics came and said, activate life flight. Um, and then my dad came and there was some like weird experiences, like almost like deja vu felt like I was in a dream. And I was like yelling that to him, like I've been here in a dream before. And it was like crazy. And then once the helicopter landed, I kind of realized and feeling into the accident more. It was like, this could be the end. Like a a spear just went through my head you know did you pull it out immediately no i i went back because it was in the ground like stuck in the ground Uh so as i came back it just came out oh got you yeah but then that was that and was kind of something that i was going to talk about in terms of the idea of surrender okay that was like a big moment of surrender that i've experienced you know when not knowing if you are going to survive or if i'm going to slip away at any moment you know so it's kind of like the thought ran through my head if this is the end like this is it and it was like that kind of peace really just deep surrender really and just acceptance and just being there so do you take that awareness with you now in terms of like how you live your day to day like you you still do you still do you have to like structure yourself to feel that state of peace and and surrender Mm -hmm. or is it something that is always kind of within you um after the accident when I could train again, because the recovery was miraculous. At first, it was like, I survived this accident. I can, <laughs> you know, and like was using that to empower my training. It was like going super hard because what I had just like gone through, I felt like training and that type of pain didn't compare at all. Um, and there was definitely like a change in my behavior. I was kind of bouncing off the walls because my brain was recovering, prefrontal cortex, you know. Mm. So it was kind of like this manic behavior that eventually settled down once I got up to college here and um, then there was some depression and stuff and over the years just reflecting on the accident processing it um, it's taken some time to really you know tap into that surrender Mm -hmm. like that idea of surrender um, and be able to live with like perspective kind of related to that you know and just what I've learned through that accident and other things so it definitely didn't like, boom, create this sudden change that was with me for the rest of my life, but it acted as a big yeah. catalyst to keep me on that path. So when it, when we talked about the prefrontal cortex, obviously like that's what releases to tap us in mainly to flow and mm-hmm. like how we handle situations mindfully. How did you, what occurred exactly if you know, like to the brain, did uh-huh. it like when it, when the prefrontal cortex gets hit, does it? did it die in a sense or did you have to like did it have to recover like i don't, I don't yeah. know how that works i mean neuroplasticity like the brain's amazing so it seems like the maybe part of the part of my brain that it hit was associated well it was because this um part of my face is still a little numb oh really so i think maybe the main damage that it did was to the nerves that run kind of through here um this jaw muscle got turned off for a while and it's slowly come back but this around here is kind of still numb. Um, but yeah, it was interesting after the accident, like the state I was in, cause I felt like, boom, totally locked into the moment because you know, there was this near death experience that I had survived. You, know, you mean when it occurred? Afterwards in the, when I came home uh-huh. and after the hospital and stuff having, cause the recovery in the hospital was pretty brutal and like, you know, it was, on lots of drugs and throwing up a lot and just really intense. Um, and then once I got home and started feeling better, like I was just so engaged with the, with the moment, 
like got totally locked into being present like all the time and so with that feeling and then having my brain be in a pretty vulnerable state you know with the prefrontal cortex being affected Mm -hmm. i was just kind of interested in all these different things like wanted to meditate all the time was writing standing up writing all night but it wasn't necessarily like total rational behavior you know it was kind of bouncing all over trying to reorient myself yeah and then that calmed down and into my freshman year of college was back into the normal (laughs) normal behavior and way of life so how how are you not blind like it pushed my eye down so it went just above my eye here like Uh through the thin eyelid and yeah just kind of pushed my eye down and i had some double vision for a while and this eye's still a little bit blurry but Uh the double vision kind of came back together wow and so when you say like near death experience, I've I've actually read a couple books on that in terms of like people have actually died mm-hmm. and then like they see certain things or mm-hmm. they experience certain things. Did you actually die or no. did were you j- it was just close? Yeah, really? just because of like the trauma of the injury and what it like felt like I had a huge just the spear went into my freaking <laughs> head, you know. Insane. So I, I, in that moment when the helicopter was coming down, it was just like yeah, I guess there was experiences, uh, like sensations. Like I said, the deja vu thing, just the weird. Did states you of actually experience that before? Like, did you have a dream about that before? That's what it felt like in the moment. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, and um, so being in that state, those thoughts ran through my head of like, this could be it, you know. Dude, and it that's kind of insane. like having had that feeling, then yeah, that that kind of triggered like that experience of surrender and just accepting naturally you know it wasn't like i was like oh this is it and just like reflecting you know it it just happened you know yeah wow that's insane man and then so as you come back um do you have a little bit of like ptsd for the for the javelin now or is it kind of just in the past well when i got home from the hospital we a couple days later picked up my javelin Uh from someone and i got home and stepped down into the yard and raised the javelin above my head and my body like shook and had this crazy reaction but then i just took a breath and did the same throw and threw it out in front of myself oh, not so not not into the ground this time right in front got of me. you so like you you just try to get over it immediately yeah dang yeah. and that's, there's that's definitely been man. there's definitely been stuff that has come up where things pro- are being processed like if I, sometimes in a movie like i'll see someone having a near-death experience or being held in like a loved one's arms like my dad was holding me um and emotions like come up you know and i'm happy with how things have been processed because i've been connected to it in a healthy way i feel like did that affect your recruiting at all no um i actually my coach at the time pat lakari he called me when i was doing doing better your high school coach or my uw coach um and he said man parker and like we chatted about it you know and then (laughs) but then he said sounds like you were doing pretty well on that decathlon before (laughs) like yeah so then he was like you want to start training as a decathlete because i was being recruited for pole vault oh okay but i imagine he saw some of my other marks and had decathlon in mind but then after that he was like you're doing well you want to train as a decathlete (laughs) (laughs) so then i started doing that yeah in the decathlon when you have like you have your first event. How much buffer time is there till the next event? Minimum 30 minutes. Um, Got you. But depending on how the rest of the meet's going, it can be a couple hours or maybe really? even more. But usually it's around 45 to an hour or around 45 minutes to the start of the next event. So what's that process, man? Like for me, you know, basketball, you're, you got the, the set time. You know, you got your warm-up time. Mm-hmm. And boom, it's you're in it, man. Like it's yeah. it's pretty bang bang. But for the decathlon, it's like y- you really need to have that mindful and awareness because you can't just be in that adrenaline like go yeah. go go mode the whole time. Yeah. And you also have to be able to turn it on like in an instance because you know you get your race or you get your event and mm-hmm. then you wait and then you get your event and then you wait. So what has been yeah. your process and? Um, just your mental process, maybe not even just the physicals, because we know how hard the decathlon is mm-hmm. physically, but just like your mental process to maintain peak performance. Yeah. 
well, since I've been doing it for a while, I've definitely developed a routine of warm up of food and being able to be comfortable coming into that first event. Yeah. And then going through the events, it's really like in golf. My dad was a golfer Mm. being able to stay engaged and kind of in a relaxed focus throughout kind of the whole, the whole day really. Yeah. And if a event doesn't go well, you just kind of got to say, all right, we got seven events left or whatever, you know? Yeah. So if things aren't going your way, you just got to let it go and try and stay in that relaxed, focused, engaged with the warm up, engaged with the next event. And then when you step up on the runway, I've been experimenting with, you know, a little, little yell before the long jump or something, just trying to tap into that confident, aggressive, let it go, let it happen. Yeah. And so this is, this is kind of just coming to me now. Um, how long is the, the decathlon is all done in one day, two days, two days, five events on each day. Okay. So let's say even, even so how long is like the, the time period for the five events Mm. from, from warm up to like the end of day one, I would say like six or seven hours. Okay. Probably. Yeah. And so with that relaxed focus, like obviously our attention span as a society has gone down a little bit with like cell phones. And then also mm-hmm. we know the distractions that those cause, like, are you using your phone at all during that seven hours? Or are you really, no. what do you, what are you tuning into? Are you locked in on, on visualization? Are you locked in on different things of, of your environment? Well, things kind of have their way of flowing through the decathlon. So you got your warm up, and then you're doing you're doing some starts for the 100. Coach giving you feedback. You do the 100. You get some water, you know, and start warming up for long jump. And it's the same event to event process of refueling, uh, warming up, getting loose for the next event. Just taking a minute to whether my, if my family's there, you know, talking with them for a sec. Um, and there's not really much room to, you know, unless if you don't have a If you don't have experience, it might be harder. But for me, there's not much room to like slip out of that focus because you're on to the next thing. Even if it's refueling or chilling for a second and stretching out, things just go boom, 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 boom through the events. Yeah. But then you talk about that, that surrender. And I was actually talking to Mitch Hanniger of the Mariners um, a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about how when he made the all-star team, he had that relaxed focus Mm -hmm for the most part for every game. But then the next year he was almost like too dialed in. Mm -hmm. He was Mm -hmm. trying to be too focused. And he said he was like too tight in terms of like, he didn't know when to let it go. Like as he stepped off the field, he was still thinking about the game or, you know, as he's on the field, he's just thinking, 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 always analyzing, always going. And then he, um, he compared it to like Robinson Cano, who's like super relaxed when he plays like, but it's more so like, he'll mess with a fan and then he's back to dialed in. <laughs> so he doesn't waste like all that energy that it takes to be fully dialed in the moment. Yeah. So do you, do you kind of feel that, um, like what is that balance for you in terms of as you're, you got to save a lot of energy for those seven hours. Like mm-hmm. what is your process in that way? Yeah, that's, that's been a really interesting journey. Cause I growing up was very natural competitor. Yeah. And then as I had success, kind of the mind started to creep in you know Mm. and overthinking some things and now I feel like I'm really tapping into letting go again and just being that natural competitor but aside from sports and the decathlon um yeah the whole journey through mindfulness and understanding the mind and where we get tense Mm. you know that has been a huge game changer in my everyday life as well as in sports. Because if I practice, I mean, I do, I practice meditation and mindfulness, you know, really all throughout the day and being aware of when I'm getting tight and self-referencing and, you know, have worry or anxiety or fear, being able to have that awareness and to just go into my body and relax and carrying that throughout my day, whether it be worrying about schoolwork or, you know, feeling like procrastinating and then all of a sudden relaxing, feeling into what's going on, accepting, and then kind of refocusing. That practice has uh, come into my sports performance. Cool. To now, if it's pole vault, which there's usually some fear going on in pole vault, you know, being able to notice that and know that it's just the mind, know that it's just like this response that's there. Yeah. And kind of just wink at it, smile at it. Love that. And then 
relax, get into the body. And even if the fear is still there, yeah, like n- recognizing for me, this has been the big thing, the witness consciousness, mm-hmm. developing that practice of being, a- being able to just see what is without judgment. Mm. Then I can still maybe even have this little thing of fear that's there, but now I'm in a different mental space where I'm confidently, faithfully going for the jump, you know? Yeah. So I'm kind of transcending that fear in a sense. There's so much to I to unpack there. I think my biggest it actually occurred a week ago. So I've been I've been meditating pretty intensively for the last two years. And I felt like my last year at APU when I was hooping, it kinda got in the way. Like I was I was doing an online mm-hmm. master's course and so I would meditate like hour, two hours in the morning, like before I went to practice. Like that was just all I studied, that's all I wanted to learn about. But I didn't there's there's such a big emphasis on non judgment because for me it was still that performance mindset. Okay, I want to meditate, I want to feel better, I wanna like get over some of these mental habits that I've developed. But then it hit me like a week ago, two weeks ago, finally hit me. You know, you can you can know it intellectually. Like I've always known, like, don't mm-hmm. judge your thoughts, don't judge it. But then it was like, dude, I'm not just because I have one bad feeling, one bad thought, it does not make me a bad person mm-hmm. entirely. You know what I mean? It took me a while to feel that experientially. And once you tap into that, you're right. Like, yeah, it's just fear. It's okay. It can be there. I'm not afraid of this moment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, And I think I feel like that's helped me in so many areas, even like podcasting, as I coach, as I train, I'm not as hard on myself. And then you also brought up laughing at it almost like winking at it. Mm -hmm. And another insight that came to me was, dude, if I was worrying about something two years ago and I look back at it now like maybe it was like oh I'm not playing enough minutes or something like that or I'm not scoring enough points I would laugh at that right now in my state of consciousness now so it's being aware of that I'm gonna laugh at this in two years anyways if you can learn to laugh at it (laughs) in the moment then you're kind of you're already setting yourself you're catapulting yourself to getting past it once we do tap into that and we do witness it then it's not it's not us like we're not a bad person we're not a bad thought it's just it's just there, yeah. you know, who knows where it's coming from. And it's a challenge, like a hundred percent, you know, I'm a perfectionist and yeah. <laughs> love instant gratification, you know, and over the last couple of years, kind of like just relating to what you were saying, it's been a process and challenge of recognizing like how I want there to not be any fear. I mm-hmm. want to have a quiet mind, you know, and I have that like dedication to flow to mindfulness yeah but now to be able to give myself space to make mistakes um and to just like know that everything goes in waves Mm. and just to relax and yeah it's a tricky balance of like being a perfectionist and want to have that discipline but then to realize that it is a process and it takes time yeah but there will be tremendous progress if we stay engaged, you know, there has been for me. hundred percent. No, I totally agree because without me doing those hours of mindfulness meditation, like none of it would have clicked as it is or as it feels now, you know, like it does, Mm -hmm. it does take time. It's a tricky thing to discuss to people because when you're like, don't worry about it, don't judge about your thoughts. They're just like, okay, why would you meditate then? What's the point? But there, I think that is the skill is to not get entangled with the thoughts and to not judge it and to not try to change it. I don't know, in, like in your perspective, when people ask me questions about it, it is paradoxical. It is, yeah. It is. So it is not something you can just, you know, like the Taoists would say, like, t- if you think you know the Tao, you don't know the Tao. Yeah. Once you tap into it, once you tap into flow, now you know it's there. And then it's getting past your mind. It's getting past like the thought and the idea of yeah. it. It's just being in that present moment. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you've experienced that as well. The paradox of non-striving, man, it's crazy. Like <laughs> yeah. in meditation, you know, going into a meditation with like um, kind of effortfully like putting my focus on my breath and having to come back to the breath and then like those negative thoughts crop up. But I feel like, um, and I actually wrote this down right here because yeah. this was really profound something that i learned uh i think last week mm-hmm. the ingredient to have concentration arise naturally to have flow and non-striving which are those amazing states of presence arise naturally mm. this book um 
The Craving Mind by Judson Brewer. He was talking about these ingredients of bringing the mind to an object, so applying the mind like to the breath, keeping the mind with the object, sustaining um, the mind with awareness of something like the breath, finding interest in the object, being content with the object, which those things can be tough. It's like, yeah. the breath, why am I watching the breath? My <laughs> mind's going around like, this is stupid. But being interested or curious, yeah. the attitude of curiosity, I, I love that. Um, and then unifying the mind with the object, which through practice kind of happens naturally. But those ingredients, bringing focus to the breath, um, interest, you know, finding content, being content with the object, all of a sudden, for me in meditation, usually around 15 or 20 minutes, if I'm doing that, this presence, this yeah. focus, this effortless being arises, and all of a sudden, yeah, like I'm just there, yeah, and I don't have to try to be there, and yeah. it's the best, you know. So it's <laughs> That's like deep, bro. It's a it's been an understanding along with yeah. building the strength and the practice day to day, you know. I think especially for athletes that um, what you just said, I'm not trying to be there, is such a uh, difficult thing to tap into because we're always like, I got to get better. I got to go train. I got to mm-hmm. do this. And uh, as I've really reflected, as I've you know, paused my playing career for a little bit, I've noticed just how almost compulsive I am towards those workouts, towards doing certain things and always doing and never being. And that feeling, bro, it's it's crazy now that when i get caught up in that for like a couple hours i'm like why am i doing this to myself like why don't i just take 10 minutes five minutes yeah. just to pause or walk through the park and like regather that centeredness that i know will assist me in who i'm talking to in what i'm doing when i'm editing i don't know oh, i think man. that's my next frontier <laughs> like why are you why are you putting yourself in these states that are not you know peak perform peak experience not like in a judgmental way but it's like that's the the space and the presence that I feel like we can always yeah. attain if we are mindful of those thoughts and our actions and where our passion and our purpose is. But, um, I mean, crazy, man. And then we, we talked a little bit about the default mode network. That's something that has uh, been brought to my awareness as of late. And it makes a lot of sense in terms of when you start meditating, that's – uh, it's almost like you, you let, you're trying to let go and the default mode is just like, nope, you're, yeah. you're staying to who you are. Like you're, you're sticking to that. Or let's go wander over here. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, no, you're not changing. You're not changing. And so it'd be cool to hear like your thoughts on the default mode network and like how mindfulness might bring that up and yeah. that might be scary in certain ways. And we might feel like it's not working, but that's the natural process we might have to go through to yeah. become who we are. Yeah, there's so much there. And one of the things that I took away from what you said is like not necessarily hitting bottom, but recognizing that mm. doing isn't doing it. Yeah. And <laughs> that's a deep one. I, I can't remember. I heard that from someone. but and, Dude, and wow. There's been a lot lately that ties into that with like yeah. the default mode network is – constantly going it's self-referencing it's the narrative it's essentially the ego you know the mind wandering Mm -hmm. and so to take on a practice of meditation especially if we're you know sometimes the beginner's mind can be really helpful but other times if we're like sitting down to meditate because our mind is irritating or something we can bring in all these unresolved issues these tensions and stuff into that practice and then boom, they're just like running through our mind, you know, because it's really easy to distract ourselves with cell phones, with whatever. And then when we sit down to meditate, there's going to be a lot that can come up. hundred percent. And so, yeah, it's, it is a huge challenge, especially today to recognize that like that default mode network, the go, 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 do, do, do distraction, like not taking time to center yourself, like, that can come up and be the first major challenge that we find in developing a mindfulness practice. Yeah. But one of the things that my favorite thing that Eckhart Tolle has said, someone asked him, what's the purpose of life? (laughs) And he said to balance being and creating. And it's like, if we look around with nature, um, even within ourselves, within our homes and stuff, it's like 
there's this state of a, a beautiful balance, especially within nature of being and creating. Yeah. And right now it's really easy to get in too far into that doing and creating mode and always going. And so when we try and incorporate the being, the doing is going to override it. And so it is yeah. like a, just the practice of when you notice your mind has wandered to bring it back because that is building the strength to incorporate and enjoy the aspect of yeah. being. Yeah. And that's been also a huge, uh, a huge upgrade for me personally. Um, I read an article. It was like NASA did a study on kids. Like 98% of kids are like geniuses. Their creativity, the things that they come up with, the bliss and the, the flow that they're yeah. in. And then as we go through through the school system, a lot of what we do is for extrinsic purposes. Like we're writing the essay for the teacher to get a grade. And for me, I've been starting to just go into nature and just try to, I don't start writing unless I feel like I'm in that flow. Mm. Like I'm not trying to force the flow. I'm not trying to force whatever's coming out of me. But I do know if I do try to force it, if I am trying to like, okay, now I'm trying to be creative. It's still that doer will. Yeah. It's not the the present will. And so I've been writing just certain poems and like trying to rhyme, not not trying, but being yeah. in that state. And it does create this immense flow because you're finally not doing anything for anyone else. You're really just present in what, in what you're doing. And I think that is very difficult. I, we don't see that as oh, much yeah. in, in society today because we do have all these things we can consume. We could watch... 400 channels on tv all these netflix shows and be on our phone all day but that peak flow is times 10 the enjoyment mm -hmm. of all those things combined in my opinion yeah but it just takes a little bit more very skillful effort i would say to yeah. tap into that and that's it's hard to talk about because we don't we're not taught that usually like we're not taught that in school there is no mindfulness class there is no like here's your emo here's your emotions awareness class. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what is that outlet for you? Maybe if you get, if you're getting a little too worried about your sport or you're getting mm -hmm. a little too caught up in schoolwork, like how do you, uh, go back into your root of intrinsic action? Yeah. I think lately, especially this year, I've been coming back to almost a faith that has developed in terms of the, when the flow happens, when the amazing poems get written, yeah. you know, it just like happens yeah. or I get like this feeling or I'm in meditation in that deep, beautiful state. And then, oh man, I feel like I could be so creative right now. And then you go and do it. <laughs> and so the faith that I feel like, or the, the thing that has developed for me is recognizing the wise mind and becoming like more in touch with this wise mind, which I like to f frame around what we're talking about, like the reward-based system of uh, trigger, response, reward, and how we can get so caught up in, there's all these little rewards with Netflix, with mm -hmm. Instagram, uh, with food that trigger like dopamine that feels good. Yeah. And we're getting set up into this default mode network of these mm. behaviors that are keeping us engaged in things like i mean yeah the self image of social media that can be rewarding when you get likes you know right. and so to be able to for me recognize the intrinsic reward and value of stepping outside of that default mode network the system one brain functioning of reactivity and even the system two brain functioning of logically thinking things through and analyzing we got system one and system two system two has a fuel tank so it can get exhausting mm -hmm. if we're always trying to think about things and figure yeah, it out analyze and the wise mind for me is system three of learning and practicing stepping back accepting focusing on something in the present <clears throat> and discovering that there is this wise, creative self that we are that comes out when we get outside of 
get out of our own way, get outside of those ingrained habits of checking our phone, yeah. of being in this reward-based processing, you know? Yeah. I actually noticed this last night when I was I was at Whole Foods, like, getting uh, getting some potatoes for dinner. I was in line f- to check out, and I see everybody in the line on their phone. And this is not, like, a judgment thing, but I, I it was almost like I – I felt inclined to go do it as well because mm-hmm. it was like everybody around me is doing it. Uh, and that was like, I was like, dude, that's a default mode network in, in a certain way. It's like a collective default now that yeah. we just, we don't interact face to face. And this is one of the things that I, why I started the podcast. This is very serotonin boosting. It's not like a dopamine thing to where, you know, we're just texting and we get that ding and we get that mm-hmm. little, oh, what's like, what just came up? You know, it's more of like a, an exchange of ideas and i think conversation is a flow in itself yeah. we're both building on ideas like we're both throwing ideas at each other um so but it does take a little bit of skillful effort have you read zen mind beginner mind Mm-mm. who's it by Do you okay know? that's that's we, we're gonna book exchange i'll give you that <laughs> one uh i actually don't even know the author's name sounds familiar but so basically what i do with all my books is i'll underline anything that i feel like resonates to me and then i'll rewrite everything i underlined and that book bro it was a beast like it it was it was like 150 pages but i think i underlined everything in that book so it took (laughs) me like days to rewrite it but basically in that it was like using effort until effort is no longer needed and there's like certain little tidbits there like right effort like what does that mean what does that feel like and so that's the journey in meditation for me learning that feeling that not just knowing that it's there mm-hmm. not just being able to talk about it but to to feel it because i think a lot of people talk about it now a lot of people talk about being mindful but yeah it's it does take a little bit of effort it takes a little bit of uh control self-control to not always be on your phone to mm-hmm. to be aware of how you wake up and how you go to bed so are the that that'd be a good one to hear from you. Like, do you have any rituals in terms of like how you wake up or how you go to bed? Mm. Well, yeah, to, to have self-control, you know, especially today, it's like we have to practice some mindfulness practices or something to get us to be able to have like more self-control Yeah. to just like put the phone down when we want to, you yeah. know? And for me and my practices and rituals and stuff, it's, come more and more into realizing that my will and like the wanting the desire to live a certain way Mm -hmm. and me like willfully trying to do that just makes things harder yeah and so really the practice that i'm most engaged with is taking moments throughout the day in the morning um in the mornings longer moments in meditation but to really come into my body and to just be with what is, to be curious about my experience, to feel into what is, and to try and get into that state of it's not like I'm trying to do anything. I'm just observing yeah. and noticing. Because that act, this is where people, well, not necessarily people, but mindfulness gets un- misunderstood yeah. in the sense that when we just observe yeah. and are curious and have an attitude of like acceptance and openness, the state of awareness that arises out of that is so empowering and intuitive, you know? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to bed and I take that moment, all of a sudden this spaciousness arises that has these ideas and this, this plan and this like power, this ability to go to bed without looking at my phone to wake up and to peacefully roll out of bed and sit down into meditation. But I have to constant, constantly apply that self-control mm-hmm. of going into that practice. Yeah. Because I'm not going into the effort like, oh, I got to oh, I gotta meditate. Yeah. Or I'm just trying to tap way into way the acceptance. I'm trying to take a moment to take a moment. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And one thing that's always stuck with me is um, – Goldstein, if you if you studied him, he's like a mindfulness mm-hmm. teacher. But yep. like his his word for that is like the in order to mind, like you're meditating in order to tap into this. Yeah, and that's that's exactly how it was, bro. It was like, oh, I got to meditate today. You know, mm-hmm. I got to tap in. But like, really, if it's if that's the reason why you're going into it again, your effort's already wrong. And that's something to investigate. 
hundred percent. Like, you know? why is it there? Uh-huh. Like, do I not feel value in my being? Is there something I'm trying to attain to like show to someone else yeah. versus just me being at peace? Um, one thing that would be interesting to hear as like you take those moments before bed, I've shifted from looking at my phone before bed and trying to put that in a different room and then reading instead. And I've had these like just insane dreams, like sometimes very dialed into what I just had read and like maybe some inner awareness that I was insecure about or needed to work through. Um, do you have any like vivid dreams when you've tried tapping <laughs> into this stuff that you feel has uh, tuned you into something deeper for self-awareness? Well, there was a moment last year uh, when I was really kind of flowing through my days where I had like this spiritual dream where like Eckhart Tolle <laughs> came in. <laughs> my guy. <laughs> and I was, I was sleeping in my bed yeah. in my dream and all of a sudden he's waking me up and he's like pulling me out of bed and urging me to just like, he, he was like, come on, there you go. Yeah. And like taking me out of bed and like, yep, there you go. Stand up. Good, good. And then <laughs> he just got me out of bed in this like urgent, just boom, wake up and get out of bed. And he was like, there, do you see how now you've gone past all these blockages, these, you know, these barriers? And I was like, whoa. And I woke up that morning and was like, I started trying it out. I just would wake up and I would just listen to what Eckhart said. I would just get out of bed and Mm. stand up. And all of a sudden I'm like in this space of like gratitude, like, all right, what's next? You know, because for me laying in bed in the morning, you know, boom, there's the train of thoughts rolling in, Yeah, you know, and it can be hard to not get caught up in whatever those first thoughts are. And they're not necessarily (laughs) good advice or like mindfulness tips, you know? Yeah. No, that's, Dude, that's awesome. I've I've always been a big, uh, I've always tried to investigate my dreams. I had like a roommate last year, and we would always like we'd wake up. That was like our ritual. We'd be like, "Bro, you have a dream? <laughs> like, oh, like what'd you dream about? Like, what'd you tap into? Let's try to like decipher it." Because I've had some dreams before games, like nights before, where I'd see exactly what was happening in the game, and it was like weird. I would mm. say it out loud as I'm shooting. I'm like, "This was in my dream," and it was like the craziest experience. It happened to me like three times in my career. I've had some dreams where just way too vivid to not like realize like, Hey man, time is not always linear. Like there is some, there's something beyond my linear train of thought, but then also, um, I don't know, man. Like you can also get, I feel like too down the rabbit hole. Last night I had a dream of like Derek Carr for the the quarterback for the Raiders. He's like, yo man, play me and put me in for fantasy. Like I'm going to go off today. So I don't know. We'll have to see how he's doing. Cause like, I was like, shoot. So I started him today. And so like, (laughs) I'm not always having these super profound dreams, but so I had a guy come in, uh, how many days ago? I think Saturday, Saturday night. No, no, Friday night. Sorry. And he came in and he was talking about how he would, his writing down his goals, like kind of really shifted things for him. And I started doing that. I I realized that like every time I was doing self-reflection in terms of like what I was reading or what I was trying to tune into or, or change about myself, it was always mainly negative. It was, there was never, dude, you had a really positive moment today or like you got over this fear or like you were able to feel flow for this amount of time. And those, I think when we get into our like anxious states or our fearful states, we latch on to thoughts way easier. Yeah. And if we don't write down the positives, we forget that they even happened and that they're just as valuable as the negatives. So have you have you tapped into that a little bit in terms of just writing down mm-hmm. um, just positive things you wanna do, goals, uh, mini goals that you wanna fall through with or, or things like that? Yeah, I do a lot of writing uh, like just journaling and when insights come up, you know, just elaborating yeah. on that. Um, and I was actually thinking about that, like positive thoughts, positive, you know, uh, recognition and stuff on the way over here. That's been something that I've been curious about is it's really easy to focus on the negative yeah. or to let these critical judgmental thoughts come up and just kind of swirl around resentments, whatever. And it can be a great practice just to reflect on what's going well what do we have in our life that like we can be grateful for i've got you know so So much but i don't necessarily always sit down and connect to that for sure but connecting to that can be a really empowering thing and for me um like with the type of practice that you're talking about lately what comes to mind is intention Mm -hmm. you know 
And lately I've been doing like a form of, of intention setting or almost like prayer in my head through thinking through like a stream of consciousness Mm -hmm. where like I have these goals with athletics, with my career, with daily living and stuff. And I take a moment and go into this like stream of consciousness that is more guided by this like imagery of achieving those goals of being of service. And there's this stream of consciousness of like prayer of goals of, um, you know, how I want to act that I can direct through my intention, but it's not like I'm necessarily thinking all these thoughts. Yeah. I just see and feel this way of living that I want to embody and then let that stream of consciousness come out within the framework of my goals, you know, and what I want to achieve. And it's this beautiful thing because it's not just the thoughts and it's not just this objective, like, goal it is an emotional Mm. practice like i'm engaging with like these emotions that when people talk about like the power of manifestation you know yeah um and what is manifestation to me it's like connecting to um our emotional selves through intention and embodying the the like vibratory state now it's like embodying that self that has won the Mm. Olympics or whatever now. And so when I'm doing that practice of that stream of consciousness of like prayer, it's super cool because it feels really good. And I see all the ways that I want to live and all the ways that I can be of service and reflect on the gratitude and the positive thoughts in that practice. So it's been really cool. Dude, that's awesome. Because I I do think we undervalue visualization in those type of ways as well. And, you know, Jeremy Taiwo, like his – he said his way to tap into the flow is just being super grateful for everything, just to unleash all of that. And I remember my best games always came when I was grateful, like just had a grateful heart. There wasn't like a fear, not that that would have been bad to have at the at the same time, but like I, I just felt my heart and I was like, wow, these this is what I dreamed about growing up. And like that state propelled me into just playing so much better, mm-hmm. being way more free having a lot more fun and I don't know man it's it's weird that we again like why do I not tap into that more why do I not consistently try to put myself in that state I don't know it's it's it is tough like you still want it like your default mode kind of gets in the way sometimes and you don't you don't even you're not even aware of it Mm -hmm. but the more you can be aware that's a win and that's that's the way I look at it you know Um, another thing I've tried to tap into is following through with commitments that I make in terms of like I try not to do try not to text and I'm sure I'll still do this but I try not to text like possibly or maybe Mm -hmm. because I feel like that opens doors for my mind to be very anxious oh I I have this going tomorrow I got this so with you like I had this game pop up and my default was like oh I should probably cancel the interview it's going to be too much that day but then I was like bro why would I why would I do that? A game's at four. I could still do this interview. Yeah, we shifted the time a little bit, but still following through with that yeah. keeps like you're working on following through with those intentions. I feel like builds your character in ways that I guess I didn't realize in the past mm-hmm. because I would always be like, yeah, maybe next weekend we'll like link. And then I think your mind unconscious, unconsciously is like, oh God, like I got this, 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 yeah. this. You're never really where you're at. Yeah. So has that has that been something that's tough I mean, obviously as a student, but a decathlete to balance being present with all the things that you got going on. Yeah, absolutely. And throughout college, I've gotten a lot better at knowing myself Mm -hmm. in that way and what like I can commit to and the things that maybe I got to cut out a little more to be able to show up for the things that matter and can get me to the places I want to be for sure so that can be yeah it makes me think about like that challenge of sitting down with ourselves and like being truthful and like sticking to like whether it be um following through with commitments um or taking a moment to write down like what are the things that Um, I need to commit to that are going to build the consistency and the routine and the practice that's going to allow me to step into 
the flow or the mm. achieve the goal. And so, like we've been saying, it's not something where we can sit down and be like, all right, here comes the thing that's going <laughs> to yeah. solve all my problems. <laughs> move and meditate. You know, it's like, no, it's a, it's a daily practice yeah. and it's, it's being honest, rigorously honest with ourself. And that is not easy. No, it's you know, not. it takes courage. Um, and a lot of times it takes like pushes from others or yeah. going through suffering. Yeah. And so that I feel like is why I'm here. Why I want to be here is to like empower others to be like, you know, I feel like I had to raise my bottom for a lot of things to be able to come closer to flow yeah. and to achieve the things that I want. And it was from the support system that I have. So now like I want to try and help people see like we can nip some of these things, nip some of these things in the bud that are going to maybe keep us on the, the yeah. side road, the like just away from yeah. really what we're trying to get at, you know, for sure. And we can sit down and do, do certain things that are going to take us to that next level, but it takes courage and yeah. commitment and consistency. Yeah. And when you talk about courage, I feel like hand in hand goes with like self-love being able to be aware, but also compassionate. Like you have to have that. When we talk about non-judgment that falls in line with it too. Self-love, compassion, and, and like non-judgment, I feel like are all, like I said, it, a lot of the practice didn't really click for me until I really felt that. It's not just another thought. It's like, damn, I'm really, I really love myself. Every aspect. Yeah. I'd love to go into like love a little bit because yeah, that's go ahead. been something that has been really interesting to see how we can confuse like excitement with love or mm, like how or that, lust. It, like, yeah. would you t- a tailor like excitement to lust? Yeah, right. And how we can let that default mode network and the like rewards and mm. the, the, the good times like, <sighs> confuse that with love yeah or like some of the ego stuff confused with love to me like love is synonymous with like acceptance yeah and uh kindness and like grace and in mindfulness practices and meditation and stuff to be able to like have a loving kindness practice where Mm. i'm wishing well for my family and all beings you know that practice takes me i feel like to this space of love, authentic love. And like you were just hitting on love is, (laughs) I don't want to say a buzzword, but it's like, love yourself, you know? Yeah. And what, what really is loving yourself, you know, because there's those fine lines of love, which is just this present experience that we embody that we can like feel as a calm, you know, just yes. Versus like, I feel like a lot of times we associate, well, we confuse love with excitement. And then all of a sudden this idea of love gets twisted yeah. and then there's anxiety forming around it. And then it's like, I'm loving myself, but it's, it's, you, it's you see what You just said after I love myself, but there's yeah. always that, but there's yeah. never like a, I just love myself. And on to like what you're talking about, the, the loving kindness practice. Um, I was doing like a, I don't know, they call it like meta or mm-hmm. something. But I was doing that practice, a guided one, and it was just like 15 minutes, and a lot of it was circulating around people you love, like pick pick one person and like really bless them because I feel like that's where people feel a lot of guilt. Like they feel like they're not doing enough for people they love or something. And for me, at the end, he was like, all right, now the last minute, like send that same love to yourself. I just started crying dude. because he was like, what he said, he's like, because you're doing, you're, because you're attempting this practice means that you really do care. Like you really do want to be better and like love. And I think for a long time, I wasn't seeing the results that I felt like should have come from it. And I, it was tough, man. It was really tough for me to experience because, um, I, I still would identify with those bad thoughts or like times where I felt like I was feeling anxious, like as bad and not just as something to accept. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely think that that's something it's hard for us to discuss because again, it's like, you got to feel that on your own. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's the, that's kind of the beauty of it. Like you don't get, you don't have to listen to everything people say, but it, at the same time, if you do choose to like take in information, that's why it's like kind of, uh, one of my mentors calls it like junk food information. Cause we just take in these bits, but we don't actually embody it. Yeah. 
in a certain way. So, or deeply listening to life itself. Like yeah. I'm a big believer that life is telling us kind of the direction we should be going and things, the things we should be committing to, but it's really hard to listen to life on that deep level. Cause a lot of times we're blocking out. Like if my family's telling me something to help me grow, but I'm here living a college, you know, life that I want to create. I'm not necessarily going to listen to them with open ears, you know, when that's life telling me something yeah. and that happens all around us. And it, it's, it's hard to really open up to the direction that we're being pushed. For sure. For sure. That's deep, man. And then just moving back to flow a little bit and like, what was your deepest present <laughs> moment? It could be athletic accomplishment or it could be anything that you've yeah. experienced. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like a lot of my flow moments in sports or just in other activities, there's often that self-transcendence component where you're in flow, but you've completely forgotten about yourself. Yeah, exactly. So a lot <laughs> in my youth, it's like I've been there yeah, deep yeah, in yeah, flow, yeah, yeah. but I don't really rem- like remember it in a sense because I was not in myself, you know, <laughs> you're so engaged with the present. Um, but then as I got into my teenage years, um, and over the last few years, there's, there was this like passion or this, these interests and questions that all of a sudden exploded for me of like, what is this? What is reality? Like, Mm. who am I? Mm. And just this deep, like metaphysical interest, which led to in like research into a scientific description of the world and trying to understand it through science and then into like more of an inner journey, which led to meditation. And when I had that like beginner's mind mm. of just being curious and doing some guided meditations, those were, that was the first time I did a guided meditation by Alan Watts, uh, one of my favorite philosophers. Yeah, he's deep. yeah. And I was so interested in the moment itself because mm. I had read and listened to all this science of like the universe is almost 14 billion years old, yeah. but here we are. <laughs> like in this moment that is that is the universe in those 14 billion years, you know, that we're experiencing. So I was like, this is crazy. What actually is going on here? Yeah. So then when I did some of those meditations, I was so interested and curious that, and I didn't know really anything, mm. you know, about flow and stuff on an intellectual level. So I just did it and got released into this present moment experience of, experiencing myself on that like I know it sounds weird or trippy or whatever but on like a cosmic level of like the being and the awareness the consciousness that I am and the nature that has like got me here Mm. and just that present moment still awareness and those moments happen you know a dozen times or so in my life have been the most profound moments in my life it's great deep limitless presence yeah I like, I like that word, bro. Limitless. Cause I feel like when you're in that flow, it's unlimited possibilities. But when we're in that like fear, anxiety state, it's like fight or flight, almost you've yeah. limited your options to like just the physical, you don't sense that overall deal. But, um, is there anything else you wanted to tap into, uh, before we close it out? I mean, I feel like we've kind of gone back and forth between like, you know, the flow experiences and how what our experiences have been in sports and stuff and that like practical everyday sense and how do we get there, you know, some of the pre prerequisites. Mm. And then for me, like this deep, this deep level of connection and presence that is the same thing as flow, but maybe leaves me with like this different understanding of myself. Um, and so now like waking up on the daily, trying to tap into flow, and trying to have that balance of letting go, you know, cause we don't, yeah. if we try, yeah. it makes things hard. <laughs> um, the thing that I would like, that has really been resonating with me the most lately is coming to like, see the nature of the mind and see how there's all this conditioning and there's like, in a, in a sense, like commercials that are playing through my head all the time, you know, stories. From, bro. Yeah. The, the narrative, the stories because of the world we live in. And so there's all this going, going on and we're trying to sift through all of it and a daily practice or just being interested in like greater 
our greater potential interested in flow for me has brought me to like realize behind all the chatter um, and the striving there is like this spaciousness Mm -hmm. there's like this natural non-conceptual intelligence that's there that's always aware and the more that i can like be with that awareness like just have that intention to connect and just try and relax and let go and just see what's there like the more that i can be with that awareness the more connected i'm going to become to it and for me that spaciousness that awareness is intelligence is wisdom is my natural authentic self and so if i can set up a practice and have interest in these things i'm just i'm headed down a road of yeah. un- authenticity of yeah. flow of wisdom of grace intuition that's deep man and it's been really cool to like rely on that spaciousness yeah to say I, there's a lot going on here but i'm just going to take a moment come into my body and connect yeah you know wow man well, that was some deep wisdom today, bro. I really appreciate like the Thank openness in, in certain parts of your journey, but also like I know for sure we'll we'll tap back in again. But uh, appreciate you coming in and, and making so the effort to come here. Yeah, it's been amazing. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, appreciate of course, it. man. <laughs>